Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this joint meeting of the Finance and Constitution Committee and the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee. Uh, we have some apologies from our colleagues, which is understandable because Parliament is still in session. Uh, the only item on our agenda today is to take evidence from the Right Honourable David Liddington MP, the Minister for the Cabinet Office, and will be taking evidence on the EU withdrawal agreement. Minister, I think we can safely state that we're living in a time of high political stakes, um, but much more importantly, at a time when perhaps the economic and social stakes have never been higher during our lifetimes. If the wrong paths chosen, then frankly, it will be the people of Scotland and indeed the rest of the United Kingdom who may pay a heavy price. So in these circumstances, I extend a, a warm welcome to the Minister and sincerely thank him for attending this joint meeting of the committee. Uh, Minister, we appreciate your attendance. We understand your diary will be very full at this busy time. Uh, but we invite you, if you wish, to make a short statement. If I may, I mean, first of all, Kavidas, can I thank you for the invitation and also to your officials for having worked at great speed so we, we could put this uh, this afternoon's session together at, at short notice. And could I also say to um, Joe McNaughton in particular that in preparing for this, I became aware that um, uh, she was overdue a response to a letter that she'd sent to me uh, some while ago about uh, UK ministers attending this. Um, I can only apologise for that delay, um, but I hope that my presence here is an indication that there is not a reluctance on our part to come and give evidence. Um, I think from the United Kingdom government's point of view, uh, the agreement that was negotiated by the Prime Minister and the other 27 EU heads of state and government um, provides some very welcome clarity uh, and predictability for citizens and for businesses, large and small, in every part of the United Kingdom. The agreement points towards a free trade agreement between the United Kingdom and the EU27, uh, involving goods of all types, including uh, agri-food agri products. We recognise also the importance of deep and ambitious customs and regulatory cooperation to Scotland and are confident that this deal will deliver for Scottish businesses in that regard. Financial services are clearly important to the Scottish economy, and I'm therefore pleased that under the arrangements set out in the political declaration, we will have a close relationship with the EU on services and investment. I believe that the deal delivers for Scottish fishermen in making the EU an independent coastal state, controlling access to fish in its waters. That means that the United Kingdom will decide who can fish in United Kingdom waters and how fishing takes place, putting us in the same position as Norway or Iceland. We'll be able to act independently to negotiate fishing quotas. The agreement guarantees that geographical indicators like Scotch whisky will be protected until a future economic relationship is put in place. And we've agreed comprehensive and close reciprocal law enforcement and judicial cooperation to keep people safe. Uh, finally, Kavidas, in terms of the process that uh, now faces us, I'm sure the committees will be aware that the United Kingdom Parliament will vote on this deal on the 11th of December. Uh, this is in line with what the European Parliament is entitled to under the treaties. It will be a vote to approve or to reject the withdrawal agreement and future framework, a yes or no vote. If Parliament votes against the withdrawal agreement, which includes the citizens' rights deal and the implementation period, then that agreement cannot legally be ratified. That is uh, the, the product of the uh, statute that was, was passed at, at Westminster earlier this year. In such an event, the, the government would be legally obliged to make a statement to Parliament on its proposed next steps and to table a motion in neutral terms on that statement. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. The first question will be from Joan McAlpine. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, good afternoon, Mr Liddington. The withdrawal agreement is 585 pages long and Scotland is not mentioned once. The political declaration is 26 pages long. Scotland is not mentioned once either, despite Scotland being the distinctive nation within the UK and the nation which voted Remain uh, by 62%, the highest Remain vote within the UK. Can I ask, why are we being ignored? I, I don't uh, accept the premise of the question. The 
Um, there, it, it, it is right, uh, Jeremy Calvin is right, that there's, there is no mention of Scotland, nor is there a mention of England, nor is a mention of Wales. All are uh, proud equal nations within the United Kingdom. There is specific mention of Northern Ireland, and that is because of the exceptional position that Northern Ireland is in by virtue of two things. First, it is the only part of the United Kingdom to have a land border with the European Union, which is therefore an e a potential EU external border with all that the treaties imply for that once we have left membership. And secondly, because of the commitment of the United Kingdom government and all parties uh, in uh, the United Kingdom Parliament, and as far as I'm aware, the, the devolved parliaments and assemblies as well, to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and the uh, overriding importance of ensuring that all parts of that still fragile settlement and peace-building process are protected. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you happen to know how many other, apart from Northern Ireland, uh, nations, regions, territories, if you like, that are part of the UK umbrella do mention in the withdrawal agreement? I've not gone through and made a, and made a count, but I know, I'm confident in what I said, that Scotland has been treated no differently from England or Wales in that regard. But there are actually 153 mentions of, of other territories, and uh, they include the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man, uh, Akatiri and Cyprus. Tristan da Cunha gets a mention, so do the South Sandwich Islands, uh, the British Antarctic Territory. Can you see why Scotland feels disrespected when the British Antarctic Territory gets a mention and we don't? We no, don't but seem to be no, I don't. No, I, no, no, not not um, on a reasonable analysis because um, uh, Scotland, um, unlike the British Antarctic Territories or the British Indian Ocean Territory or the South Sandwich Islands, has members of Parliament elected in the United Kingdom, is a full part of the United Kingdom. Those other territories are not part of the United Kingdom. They are either crown dependencies that have a particular relationship but are not fully part of the European Union by virtue of protocols to the uh, European treaties, or they are crown dependencies, which, um, while different in constitutional status from the, uh, the British Overseas Territories, are um, also entities that are self-governing, are not part of the United Kingdom, are not part of the European Union, but have a relationship with the United Kingdom provided for in protocols to the, the treaties. And therefore, part of the responsibility of the United Kingdom government in conducting these negotiations has been to ensure that the interests of those territories outside the United Kingdom itself are properly safeguarded and protected in those negotiations. I, I, I honestly don't think that that is anything that should be seen as a threat to Scotland. In my experience, people in Scotland fully understand the need for the United Kingdom government to ensure the interests of the Isle of Man or Gibraltar are properly protected. I was suggesting that that was the case. I was merely suggesting that uh, people in Scotland had an expectation. Indeed, they were told uh, that their wishes would be considered, for example, when the Prime Minister came to Scotland in July 2016. Our coach actually said, I'm willing to listen to options and I've been very clear with the First Minister that I want the Scottish Government to be fully engaged in our discussion. Now, the Scottish Government has said that they have not been uh, fully uh, engaged at all. Scotland, uh, this Parliament, uh, voted for a compromise solution to remain within the single market and we have been ignored again and again. And as a result of that, we're now looking at a deal which will result in the Scottish economy being damaged to the tune of £1,600 a year, which is the cost to each person per head of a free trade agreement. Do you understand why people feel that they haven't been respected and included in, the, in a process which has a very direct um, effect on their lives and their livelihoods? I think, I think that if you look at what is in the detail of the both the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration, you will find that there are many things there which reflect the positions that the Scottish Government itself and the Scottish Parliament itself have advocated. Um, I completely acknowledge that there are political differences between the Scottish and United Kingdom governments over the shape of the, uh, the final deal. When I, whenever I've sat down with Scottish ministers, uh, you know, those differences 
are acknowledged about the, 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 some of the, the overall policy objectives. Uh, but you know, the Scottish government's been clear throughout that um, it's about its preference to remain fully part of the, the single market. That is different from the position of the United Kingdom government. But um, if you look at what is in the, uh, the political declaration on trading goods, including agri-food, we've got an agreement for the creation of a free trade area for goods that facilitates trade through a new customs arrangement, deep regulatory cooperation, and avoids any tariffs and quotas. So, and that is a priority for people in Scotland and elsewhere in the United Kingdom. If I look back at what was said in the publication two years ago of Scotland's place in Europe, that said it's important to ensure continuing participation in law enforcement, criminal law, and civil law measures. And there's a whole section in the political declaration about a future security partnership to enable strong operational capabilities to tackle serious crime and terrorism, swift and effective data exchange, fast-track surrender programmes, and continued close cooperation with Europol and Eurojust. The Scottish Government, in its uh, publication, Scotland's Place in Europe, last month, uh, no, I beg the committee's pardon, this, the, earlier this month, uh, called uh, for um, continued full participation in competitive EU funding programmes. And we are committed to seeking associate membership of or participation in such programmes as uh, the Erasmus Plus and the successor to Horizon, provided, of course, that the design of those in the future continues to match the, uh, the, the strategic priorities of the United Kingdom overall. Um, and uh, we, of course, would be prepared to make an appropriate financial contribution to those programmes as part of the price for such participation. Well, I you know, talked about, was talking about this with um, uh, some of the uh, professionals at uh, Stirling University earlier today. I mean, they're very clear this is what they, they wanted to see, and they hoped that this was the outcome not just of the political declaration, but of the final partnership agreement too. It doesn't guarantee participation in those programmes, Erasmus, for example. Well, you, ca you can't guarantee things which would be the outcome of a negotiation which, in terms of the European treaties, cannot be commenced until we've actually left, as the committees will know. Uh, the treaties uh, provide for member states to have particular rights and particular obligations. Uh, and the treaties also provide for the EU collectively to negotiate uh, trade agreements and political cooperation agreements, scientific agreements with third countries. And the consistent position of the uh, European Commission, and I think that reflects the 27th view, and to be honest, um, looking back at my experience as Europe Minister, I think it's probably an accurate reflection of the distinctions made in the treaties. They say, until you've actually left, while well, we can have, in the meantime, political commitments about the future negotiation, we cannot have formal legal negotiations uh, to turn that into it, those commitments into legal text. Okay. But I've, each member's got a certain time they're going to have to, to, to use here. Minister, and, and I'm trying to encourage everybody to be as concise as they can be so I can get through all my members around the table. Adam Tom. Thank you, uh, Convener. Good afternoon, Minister, and thank, thank you for joining us um, here this afternoon. I, I, I want to ask you two questions, if I may. Hopefully the first one will be relatively short. The second one we might need to go into a bit more detail. But the first question I wanted to ask you is this. At, at the moment, one of the most significant, perhaps the most significant difference of view between the United Kingdom government and the Scottish government about the withdrawal agreement is that it's the UK government's position that it's essentially this deal or no deal. And the Scottish government um, have reiterated even as recently as uh, at First Minister's questions today um, uh, that there are other options still on the table. So w why is it that the UK, uh, why is it the UK government's view that it's, it's really now this deal or, or, or no deal? Um, partly, um, there, there is a, a time factor in involved, but, but chiefly because to get to this deal, both sides have had to, to move. There's been, there has been give and take on both sides, and I expect members of the two committees here have picked up some of the flack directed at Michel Barnier by uh, other EU governments over the past fortnight um, for uh, supposedly giving us too soft a time. Um, but the Commission and the heads of government, President Macron, Chancellor Merkel, Chancellor Kurz, others, could not have been clearer that as far as they are concerned, this is the deal. They are not interested in reopening. Frankly, they have their politics too. They have other priorities that are on their list to, to do. 
if I talk to French politicians at the moment, they're actually thinking much more about Italy and the uh, future of the Eurozone, the challenges the Italian budget proposes, uh, proposes to that, than they are about Brexit. They want this done and sorted, and they're making very clear to us that they are simply not prepared to countenance reopening a deal which they, in their, their, in their view, made concessions to obtain. So it's not simply that it's the UK government's assertion that it's this deal or no deal. It's the UK government's reading of European politics, both in key member states of the European Union and in the, and in the European Union institutions themselves, uh, that, that lead you to that view, that there is, there is no yes. room, there's no appetite, there is no space yes. for any kind of renegotiation there's, between now and Brexit. Day. There's absolutely no appetite for, for this. That, and that uh, is, has been true of both their public and private statements. They have other things do. They need to sort out some of the challenges the Eurozone faces. They have to devise a future multi-annual budget for the European Union without the United Kingdom's contributions. Devising those budgets, when I was involved in that last time round, it took about two and a half years. Um, so they have to get on with, with that at pace. So they need, they need this and want it sorted and they need to move on. Thank you very much. I, I want to ask you about the, the Northern Ireland backstop. Now, um, as you'll appreciate, some of my colleagues around the table are of a nationalist persuasion. I'm not. I'm of a unionist uh, persuasion, Minister. And, um, and you will know that there are a number of concerns um, uh, within uh, both uh, Northern Irish unionism and Scottish unionism, and these two are very different sorts of unionism for all sorts of reasons. But there are concerns within Scottish unionism about the extent to which the Northern Ireland backstop, as um, provided for at length in the withdrawal agreement, um, uh, will lead to a differentiated settlement for Northern Ireland on the one hand and the rest of the United Kingdom on, on the other, and that this is difficult um, from, from a unionist perspective. So unionist to unionist, what can you say to me and to my unionist friends around the table uh, that would reassure me that this is a deal that does not pose an unacceptable risk to the United Kingdom? First of all, um, nobody whatsoever in London, in Brussels, in Dublin, in any other capital, um, wants this to be used. They want it to be an insurance policy that is there just in case. And my conversations with the Taoiseach and the Tornister, they have both been absolutely clear on this point. Um, but you know, it, 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 this all uh, derives from the political and the genuine security uh, significance of the uh, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland border. Um, and certainly, if, if one listens to what the Chief Constable of Northern, the Northern Ireland Police Service, George Hamilton, has said repeatedly, he is deeply alarmed about any prospect of there being the need for any kind of border checks or infrastructure at all. But the Irish government could not have been clearer to me and in public that they want this not to be used. They want to go quickly to a UK-EU trading relationship that obviates any need for the backstop. And if it were ever needed, they want it in place for as short a time as possible. And I can happily go into the reasons of the committee's wish why I believe that the 27 have every incentive not to uh, try to uh, Mr. keep Mr. the best. Sorry, sorry to cut across you. I, I mean, I fully accept that it is the stated intention that it's there as a um, not just a backstop, but a kind of long stop um, insurance policy. But let's, for, just for the sake of argument, let's assume that it does come in, in, into force. Now, as I understand it, um, uh, the backstop will require, as a matter of European, as a matter of binding European law, um, Northern Ireland to continue to adhere to. Um, a number of provisions of single market law with regard to goods. Um, uh, if the rest of the United Kingdom is not required during that period to adhere to those provisions of single market law with regard to goods, isn't there going to be regulatory divergence between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom that would have the effect of risking the integrity of the UK's internal market? I understand, I understand the point. The first, first thing I'd say is that for many months, the, the EU um, position was that only Northern Ireland's specific arrangement on both customs and, and, and uh, regulatory alignment was uh, obtainable, uh, that a, a, a UK-wide one was just not negotiable. It's only been in the last month 
that they have conceded the point on customs. And we were clear from February when the Commission published its draft protocol that we could never accept that and didn't believe any British government could accept the division of the United Kingdom into more than one customs territory. Now, they've conceded that. On regulations, um, as uh, Professor Tompkins knows, there are already uh, areas in which Northern Ireland diverges from Great Britain. Um, uh, livestock is one, the island of Ireland being a single epidemiological area. Electricity is another because of the single electricity market across the border. Um, what we have sought to do in the negotiation is to minimise any of the risk of the kind Professor Tompkins uh, alludes to, to the bare minimum necessary to ensure that that backstop can, is, is, that insurance policy is there for the sake of the peace building process in Northern Ireland, and that the experience of ordinary businesses on either side of the Irish Sea uh, should, should res be pretty much exactly as it is now. So to take livestock, for example, EU law would indeed require, in those circumstances, more intensive livestock um, inspections than are already currently carried out. That the principle is already there in, in the current arrangements. It still will have to go through the Port of Larne as now. Um, but the Commission's already signalled that it wants a veterinary agreement. The veterinary agreement New Zealand has with the European Union has reduced the number of uh, livestock imports to the EU from that country to just 1% of the total. So there are tried and trusted ways to make this a minim minimalist burden. When it comes to regulatory, other regu to in regulatory checks on industrial goods, there are several things I can say, I think, to give um, uh, comfort. Yeah, I will try and, I'll try and, be, I will try and be, 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 be very brief. First of all, um, any checks would be only on the market, and they, so things like trading standards officers, nothing at the borders, carried out um, through normal market surveillance mechanisms by UK officials uh, within Great Britain. Secondly, we as a government have given a guarantee that we would seek, if the backstop were ever used as a temporary measure, we would seek to align GB with Northern Ireland so that they had the assurance that there would not be that diversion or any risk to uh, the single market. Unless anyone misunderstands, we, we accept that would mean some conversations with devolved governments in Wales and Scotland as well. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank listen, you. I've allowed a bit of latitude at the beginning because I knew that, that was inevitably going to be the process, but I'll need to try to make this a bit sharper if I'm going to get through everybody. Neil Finlay. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I know Mr Tompkins said that there was nationalists and unionists round the table. I'd remind him there's also socialists round the table. Indeed, I, I think you may have been one in a previous life. Um, <laughs> the, uh, this deal appears to be going absolutely nowhere. Um, the opposition parties, all of them in the House of Commons, are opposed, including your former chums, now the estranged DUP. Um, the ERG are never going to accept this. And um, some of, let me call them, your more rational backbenchers are not going to accept this either. So it looks as though, in, in the eyes of the government, we are heading for no deal. And that would mean, given the Treasury's analysis, uh, over 9% reduction in economic activity, the end of security arrangements, a hard border in Northern Ireland, and all the rest that goes with it. Do you seriously think that the British people are going to accept that? I, I believe that um, uh, a no deal would be seriously damaging uh, to the UK economy and UK interests, and it is certainly no part of the government's objectives. We nevertheless have to plan against that risk, not least because it isn't just Westminster that has to vote on this, it's the European Parliament as well. And so just as any sensible business has contingency plans that they hope you know, can stay in the safe and, and um, not have to be deployed in practice, um, so we need to have done the thinking and the preparation uh, on, in the, on the basis that any government or any, any commercial organisation would do. In terms of Parliament, um, my, my view is that um, members of Parliament at Westminster, all political parties, all parts of the uh, United Kingdom, do need to confront um, very serious, a very serious choice that has to be made. The message I have had overwhelmingly from businesses in my own constituency, different parts of the UK, I was picking it up again in Scotland today, 
is for goodness sake, get on and get this done. We want government to um, be focusing upon other important domestic political po uh, and policy priorities. Um, and business wants the clarity on uncertainty of the implementation period and the approach to free trade uh, agreement and other forms of cooperation that are spelled out in the political declaration. And I think the one thing that is certain about a vote in Westminster to reject this deal would be that there would be continued and acute uncertainty. Because you certainly have some people campaigning to say head for no deal. You'd have others campaigning to say let's reverse the 2016 result altogether. Uh, and I, I genuinely think that, particularly in light of what I said earlier to, to um, to uh, P P Professor Tomkins, it, it, this is the deal that the EU has been prepared to negotiate. I do not believe the appetite is there to reopen the package and start looking at things again. And I think we will be getting into more dangerous, more risky territory were this to be rejected. Yes, of course people want it done. If I hand my car in to get fixed, I want it done. I don't want them to prevaricate. I want it done. But I want them to tighten the wheel nuts so they don't fall off. And what we've got here is exactly that. We've got a deal that looks as though the wheels are going to fall off very, very quickly. Do you accept that the House of Commons can, um, uh, they, a, a motion can be put forward that is not no deal and is not your deal? A motion, the, 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 uh, the motion that the government puts forward is, has put forward is a substantive motion. Um, uh, it will certainly be amendable in terms of the rules of order of the House of Commons. I'm aware of at least one amendment that has been tabled already. I'm pretty confident there will be others as well. It's entirely up to the Speaker of the House of Commons to decide which amendments are in order and which orderly amendments then to select for division. So that's a matter for, that is a matter for the Speaker. Um, I think as a matter of legal certainty, given the statutory requirement for any agreement reached by the government to be approved in the so-called meaningful vote before it can be formally ratified, there does need to be a clear vote for or against that uh, agreement if there is to be legal certainty for the future. But it, it's not in the government's hands to decide what amendments are tabled or which are brought forward for division. So you said you're um, preparing for every scenario. So if, that, uh, if the, the deal is rejected and the Commons does vote for an amendment that says we want another deal, what are you preparing? What have you got prepared, well, the, as, as have I, you got prepared in that scenario? Well, as I said in my, my introductory remarks, the, the, the government already is subject to a statutory obligation, um, certainly in, in the event of it looking like no deal, to uh, come forward with a statement and, and a a set of proposals to Parliament about what it considered to be the way forward. But I think so far the amendment, none of the amendments that I have seen either published or bruited, um, is actually putting forward a clear alternative to what the government has, uh, has, has placed on the table. Um, no no uh, sort of rival proposition has yet provided evidence that uh, what they want is something that the other 27 countries are remotely prepared to countenance. But we're, we're, I'm afraid you're out of okay. time on that particular situation. Patrick Harvey, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Um, I have to say that I, I speak to more people who want this not to be done than who just want it done. Uh, but that aside, the, the UK government, uh, in acknowledging the economic hit that is likely from the various scenarios, generally falls back on the argument, well, this is what people have voted for. People have made their decision uh, back in 2016, and if the choice is between uh, being much poorer and being slightly poorer, the, the democratic mandate is still there. And there clearly were majorities in England and in Wales uh, for leaving. The overwhelming majority in Scotland was for Remain. Northern Ireland voted Remain as well, but at least it gets something that it needs, a specific set of, of mechanisms uh, to look after its needs. Scotland, of the four nations within the UK, remains undeniably the only one of the four which gets neither what it needs nor what it wants. Uh, and can I suggest to you that if, if you're the, 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 the one who's supposed to be holding the union precious and looking to preserve it, can I just suggest to you, you're going a funny way about it. 
Well, I think in my earlier answer to uh, Joe McAlpin, I listed a number of the ways in which uh, what is in the agreement does provide the very things that the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament have been calling for. Um, I think that the there is, I think, an app. I mean, uh, Mr. Har Mr. Harvey and I may, di may differ on this with who, who we speak to, but I do think there is a real yearning in very large sections of the population, particularly in the business community, which have come out in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, elsewhere, in support of this, to, to say we need to have this sorted, we need to have clarity and the ability to plan. Because at the moment there are investment decisions, there are employment decisions that have been put on hold because businesses are not yet able to plan with certainty. Get the implementation period in place, get negotiations going on the way forward. And I think that's the, that is the best news as far as living standards and economic growth in the future is concerned. Well, I, I, I certainly did see one, one uh, business voice from, from Scotland backing the, the deal recently, uh, Mr. Ratcliffe from, from NEOS, a tax dodging billionaire. And it didn't hugely surprise me that that's the kind of support that you're calling on. Uh, I'd like to move on, because uh, we are tight for time, and talk about some of the environmental governance aspects. Uh, the one silver lining to this cloud that I can see uh, is that the political declaration does make it pretty clear that there will ultimately be a common fisheries policy. Shared stocks, sustainable management, quotas, access to waters, the works. Uh, and the idea of returning to some sort of isolationist approach is clearly blown out of the water. But there's clearly a lot less clarity on the issue of climate change. Uh, paragraph 72 of the, the political declaration says the party should consider cooperation on carbon pricing by linking a United Kingdom national greenhouse gas emission trading system with the EU's ETS. Uh, I can't find anything on the UK government's website that tells me what the UK ETS will be, how it will work, when it will be established. Are you able to answer those questions? Now, this will be part of the negotiation. I'd actually reject Mr. Harvey's uh, description of the proposed fisheries arrangements in the, uh, in the political declaration. It's very clear the language says expressly that the United Kingdom will be an independent coastal state. That means we will have the rights and responsibilities of a country like Iceland or like Norway. On climate change, I mean, let's not forget that there are UK-wide statutory obligations already on the government to ensure that we continue to reduce our carbon emissions at speed. And we have a pretty good record, if you look overall, uh, compared with um, most other developed economies. We need to do more than that. We need, in the negotiations that would start from March, to get to grips with the detail of emissions trading schemes and the like, and those ministers and officials with lead responsibilities for that will be very much wanting to crack on with that task. The, the political uh, statement, political declaration has been negotiated already. You must have some idea that the mechanism that you're proposing, a UK ETS, is deliverable and have some notion of, of what it will look like. Can you at least guarantee that it won't be based on the UK ETS that preceded the EU ETS, which wasn't even mandatory? Well, I'm not, I, I'm not in a position to go into detail on that because those negotiations have not started. But what we have what we have committed ourselves to is very clearly no regression in our environmental standards. And frankly, I, I detect no appetite uh, in amongst my cabinet colleagues, um, in parliament, amongst public opinion, uh, anywhere in the United Kingdom for uh, a diminution of environmental standards. I think that that's the, public, the public expects us to be leading the, the international pact, not have. falling behind. Can I, can I just suggest we, we are... Oh, I'm, I'm do I have a moment left? To be very, very quick. We, very we quick. are at a point where there is a new wave of anger and impatience, particularly among younger people who've been uh, demonstrating in the most creative ways in London and are going to do so again in Scotland as well uh, for, for more ambitious action on climate change. And it does seem that you've created an unnecessary political crisis with Brexit when you should be fixing the climate crisis, and there is absolutely nothing in this document that says how your mechanisms are going to work. I, I don't see there being a contradiction between uh, coming to a sensible future partnership, ambitious future partnership with the EU, and continuing both in that context and nationally and globally to continue to try to lead the way on climate change. That's what we should be doing. 
Tavish. Scott, please. Um, I represent Shetland, so you'll probably understand why I'll drag you back to Fisheries, uh, uh, Minister. Um, the, the question I really wanted to ask was, why was fisheries included in the transitional period? That, that, that was one of the, the outcomes of the, of the negotiations. It also ensured that we continued for that transitional period to have the certainty of access to um, uh, markets elsewhere in the EU for fish and shellfish and products um, that uh, Scottish, English, Welsh, Northern Irish uh, fishermen uh, had taken. Um, also, the other, the other um, issue that is obviously self-evidently there with the implementation period is that we were facing a decision about a potential deal in 2018. 2018, we will be having the talks as full members of the EU for 2019, including a period when we will be outside. Um, and I think it was what we had was a, a for the implementation period was a, reason, a reasonable outcome to settle this period during uh, the, during transition. But you'd accept in the period that will now take place after March, uh, the industry has no formal input into the EU negotiating machinery, and therefore they wonder how exactly they're um, going to influence. No, I mean, it's the of course we take part as a full member state um, with all those rights and responsibilities in settling the quotas for 2019. So there is one year when uh, we uh, would be non-members, but we would be in the uh, implementation period. That would be settled in December 2019 for the calendar year 2020. Um, and in the agreement, as um, Mr Scott knows, uh, there is provision, there's an obligation on the EU to uh, act in good faith, taking account of UK interests, and the, the keys to uh, the quota system, uh, part of that agreement is that they will not be touched. Okay, so in the Prime Minister's letter published this week, it says at the end of the transition period, if no fisheries agreement is in place, no EU country's fishing fleet will have access to our waters. Now, I'm sure you're aware two thirds of fish landed in the United Kingdom goes into Europe. Where do you think it'll go if it can't go to Europe? I think what we're making clear is that both sides have an interest in coming to a fisheries agreement. Us as an independent coastal state by that stage and the EU as an important commercial partner. And that would be in, the li in, in line with how Norway or Iceland operate in their relationships with the European Union. But I think, that it, it, I think this indicates why, um, one of the reasons why, for example, you know, any, the backstop, let alone any prolonged backstop, is actually not in the interests of the EU27. Because if, they, if, if we were in the backstop and there was no fishers agreement in place, they would lose straight away any legal entitlement to fish in UK waters. Now, it's always been the case, um, the fish migrate between jurisdictions, you have stocks that straddle. Uh, jurisdictions. So the sensible thing is for us to sit down as a you know, very big player in the sort of North Sea, Atlantic um, uh, fisheries areas to talk with our neighbours about um, access arrangements and access to markets for fish and, and shellfish. That is the way other, country, other independent coastal states go about it. What you've described, is it not, is a, is a direct linkage between access to waters and access to markets? Or, I said fisheries. The, the, what has caused a furor in the last week is the suggestion um, from President Macron that uh, the, the question of access to waters should be linked to uh, access to trading markets generally in, in all sectors. Now, this is something on which the Commission made concessions during the negotiation, because if you look back at the wording of their mandate last spring, uh, they were saying you know, that the mandate said you, future UK access to the EU market per se, not just fish, has to be linked to access to UK waters. We dug in and we said, no, that's not how independent coastal states operate. And in any other um, uh, EU third country agreement, those issues are distinct. Trade is separate from access to waters. And so you know, the, that, that remains our position. And the EU 
uh, agreed not to push that in the final negotiation. Thank you. One final question on trade. Um, convener, the Scottish Salmon Farmers Producers Organisation, worth £600 million to the Scottish economy every year in terms of exports, said last week, in terms of the political agreement, that by coupling aquaculture with future catch fish quotas, <coughs> the document raises the prospect of tariffs being imposed on exports of farm fish. That would be calamitous news for, for a very important Scottish industry. What's the government's response it's to certainly that? Not, it's certainly not something that we would want, and that's why the, the fact that the political declaration looks forward to tariff-free trade is something that is very welcome. And certainly, I mean, I, I'm very well aware of the importance of um, exports of salmon uh, for the Scottish economy, and, and in particular for Highlands and Islands, um, and that would be a, a very considerable priority for UK negotiators. Thank you. Thank you for the sh sharp, snappy questions, Tavish. That was very helpful. Tom Arthur. Thank you, Good afternoon, Minister, and thank you for joining us. I would like to focus my questioning on the future trade agreement with reference to the context that that will take place in as a consequence of the withdrawal agree agreement. Clearly, there are, are particular pressures that the UK will face in negotiating. Given that, to achieve an independent customs policy will ultimately require the European Union to can, um, agree a deal with the United Kingdom. But more specifically, there, there are some time pressures which I wish to explore. The withdrawal agreement stipulates that a decision on extending the transition period is required before July 1st, 2020. And due to the EU political calendar, and as you acknowledged, other pressing commitments in Europe, substantive negotiations between the UK and the EU cannot effectively commence until the autumn of 2019. Given the Prime Minister's stated goal of not wishing to invoke an extension to the transition period, this leaves approximately eight months for the substantive negotiations on the future trade deal between the UK and the European Union to take place. And these negotiations are to be based on the 26-page non-binding political declaration. Now, for context, at the time of the EU referendum, the EU's most ambitious trade deal was a comprehensive economic and trade agreement with Canada. Incidentally, Minister, do you know how long that agreement took to negotiate? Yeah. So you'll appreciate that it took seven years yeah. to negotiate and a further year to provisional implementation. And it runs to over 1,600 pages, nearly three times the length of the withdrawal agreement. Minister, how long will it take the UK to negotiate a trade deal with the European Union? Depending on the degree of political will on both sides to achieve that. But I'm relatively optimistic um, for a number of reasons. First, I think that um, uh, Mr. Arthur's being too pessimistic in saying that uh, substantive negotiations can't start until the new commission is in place next autumn sometime. Um, the writing instructions have now been given. Uh, there is absolutely no reason why uh, preparatory work should not commence. Indeed, uh, as the committee will know... Tim, can you give me an estimate of how many months or years? I think, no, we, I think it is quite possible, just as we turned the... Are you unable to give me an answer as to how many years it will take to we, negotiate? Well, I'm, well, well, I'm, I'm trying to, to give you an answer. It's a bit like a John Humphreys interview at times. The, um, uh, the, um, the, we turned the uh, declaration of the European Council last December into a nearly 600-page legal text within less than a year. We have till the end of 2020 to get the political, the, the, the economic agreement in particular in place. We start, unlike Canada, from a position where we are in complete conformity with EU standards and EU regulations and furthermore have imported the acquis onto a United Kingdom legal basis by virtue of the withdrawal Act. So unlike CETA or unlike the association agreement with Ukraine, we do not have to go through this uh, immense process of working out the, the degree and speed of alignment. We're starting from complete alignment. So I think that can be done and the EU has a tried and trusted practice of provisional application once agreement has been reached before even formal ratification. I appreciate the very circuitous way to say it, I don't know. Um, since the referendum, the EU has completed further negotiations, including the EU-Japan -Econ Economic Partnership. This took four years to negotiate and is still awaiting implementation. Britain's former ambassador to the European Union, Sir Ivan Rogers, said it could take up to 10 years to negotiate a post-Brexit EU trade deal. 
Now, let me put a very specific question to you, Mr Linderton. Businesses in my constituency who export to the EU, will they have to, can you guarantee here today that they will not have to pay additional tariffs after 2021? I can't, can speak, well, I can't speak for 27 other national governments. What I can point Thank to you. is That's... the fact that those governments, each of them, has agreed to set themselves the objective of doing this comprehensively by the end of 2020. Well, I can get another question, in, I'm afraid, in these circumstances. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, Minister. Uh, I wonder if I could uh, follow on from the questions Adam Tompkins asked around the Northern Irish uh, backstop. One of the concerns that the, the Scottish Government has raised is that in the event of the, the backstop applying, that would leave Northern Ireland in a situation where it was in the single market for, for the EU single market for goods, but Scotland and the rest of, of Great Britain uh, would not be. And uh, the Scottish Government has expressed a concern that that would then give businesses in Northern Ireland a competitive advantage over businesses in Scotland. Can you tell us what the, the UK government's view is on that concern? I think that, um, I mean, first of all, I, I'd again say the, the clear intention of all sides is that this is not used. If it's used, it's for a short time as possible. Secondly, um, that not the alignment of Northern Ireland with the, um, the EU on goods is only in respect of those things necessary to ensure... Um, that no need for any sort of controls at the Irish border. So if we were look at this in terms of pages of single market rules, um, it, it amounts to about 40 pages of those rules under the agreement out of about 1,100 pages of single market rules, if we look at the whole proposition. I think in practical terms, um, the 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 degree of difference between businesses in Scotland and, the, and businesses in Northern Ireland will be marginal. I think where Northern Ireland businesses could well have an advantage is sales within the island of Ireland. Um, because then, and, and, and I think that has certainly caused a few uh, complaints south of the, the Irish border. We're not expecting businesses in Scotland to, to relocate to Northern Ireland to take advantage of this, nor would we expect that investors coming into the UK would favour Northern Ireland over Scotland. And I wonder if, if given the views of Scottish business on this, and, 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 and contrary to Mr Harvey, you know, we, we know quite well what Scottish business thinks around what's proposed. Scottish business is very clear that they want to see the deal proposed by the UK government go through. They may well, may well have reservations about it, but overwhelmingly, the voice of Scottish business believes that should be supported. Have any uh, of these voices in Scottish business expressed a concern to you or the UK government about a competitive disadvantage Scotland might be in in the event that Northern Ireland, because of the backstop, remains in the single market for goods? No, I, 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 what I've had from Scottish business is um, clarity that they want the, the UK-wide single market uh, protected. They know that... Um, uh, Scottish exports, if one terms from that to the rest of the UK, about four times the value of, of, of those to the other 27 countries of the European Union. Um, but no, the, the appetite I find from Scottish business in all sectors is please get on, do this. We need the ability to plan with some confidence for the future. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mardo. Angela Constance. Thank you very much, Convener. It uh, seems to me, Minister, that this deal is designed to uh, achieve one thing and one thing only, uh, and that's end the freedom of movement, uh, apparently, uh, once and for all, not something uh, that we've asked for uh, in this Parliament. So uh, can I ask you specifically, sir, do you know what percentage of Scotland's population growth over the next 25 years will come from migration? Well, I think... One would have to have a degree of caution about predicting 25 years ahead, but the, um, while I haven't got the figure immediately to mind, I've certainly been told by Scottish ministers that it is significant, and there's a particular issue for Highlands and Islands, which I, I appreciate. Okay. Well, it's, it's actually 100%. Uh, so our population growth over the next 25 years is reliant entirely on uh, migration. So if I could also press you further, uh, do you know by what percentage Scotland's working age population uh, would decline by 
without EU migration? Well, I think the, the premise behind the question is that there would be no migration at all. Of course, the UK government is preparing a white paper on future migration policy that will spell out the approach that we plan to take. That would be in addition to the proposals for a specific migration partnership that are included in the political declaration on the future relationship. Um, and there will clearly be a need for provision for um, people, um, particularly those with high skills, who perhaps on intra-company transfers and the like, to be able to move into the United Kingdom or from the United Kingdom to other countries. Um, the, the proposition is that we should, in future, for new, new uh, comers from the European Union, apply the same, broadly the same rules as apply to people from other parts of the world, so they were looked at equally in terms of skills and particular market, market needs in, in sectors in our economy. So what we um, are sure of, given your answer, uh, Mr Liddington, is that it all seems rather um, uncertain. <coughs> um, because what we know that without EU migration, Scotland's working age population uh, will decline uh, by 3%. Uh, and I wonder, um, do you think uh, that will have a positive or a negative impact on Scotland's public finances? Well, I think that's, um, that... that uh presupposes a number of judgments about the, the, the structure of uh, the economy in Scotland, about how uh, Scottish governments now and in the future can make Scotland a more attractive place for inward investment and employment uh, and provide incentives for people to, to come in. But I think there's no avoiding the fact On that, that point, free movement of people was the prime... One of, one of the prime reasons why a majority of the UK as a whole voted to leave in, 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 in 2016. So I, you know, I, I think there's no well, okay. avoiding that reality. If, if you give me if I just uh, stop you there, bearing in mind uh, you're giving evidence to a parliament in a country that voted 62% uh, to remain, uh, and bearing in mind that you're also giving evidence to uh, the Finance Committee here today in Scotland's parliament that has thoroughly explored the demographic risks to uh, Scotland's uh, budget, given that um, <coughs> everybody knows that population population growth as a driver for economic growth and that the funding of public services in Scotland is dependent on economic growth in a way that's not the case uh, in terms of how uh, regions in, uh, in England are funded. And without uh, migration, we can't grow our working age population. So why on earth would we support a deal that seeks to end freedom of movement once and for all? Well, on the, the, the broader issue of principle that Ms Constance mentioned, um, uh, I, it was a, a UK-wide vote. I completely acknowledge that two parts of the UK voted one way, two parts voted the other way. Had the result gone 52-48 you know, the other way to remain, and it had been the Scottish vote, votes had been decisive in the remain vote, that uh, should have been accepted as well. Asking about the risks... <coughs> to our budget as a result of a declining working age but that population. Is, that is why the... Which you have given no consideration to. That is why the immigration system already has a shortage occupation list specifically for Scotland, which the Migration Advisory Committee keeps up to date to ensure that it reflects changes. So far, the evidence that the Migration Advisory Committee has presented and published has shown not much difference between shortage occupations in Scotland and in the rest of the UK. But they conceded that they didn't do any modelling for Scotland. I, I, I know you don't want to move on, but I'm going to have to move on to James Kelly if I'm going to get through this process. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, Minister. Uh, Minister, we heard yesterday from your colleague, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond, that the consequence of this agreement being implemented would result in the UK economy being smaller. Uh, as a direct, direct result of that, the money available to the Scottish budget via the block grant uh, will be less and we'll have a reduced Scottish budget, won't we? Well, what the, the Treasury scenarios that were published yesterday all show 
under any circumstance is continued growth the, uh, in the future. The, uh, the, what the Treasury analysis was doing was to compare different outcomes over the, the long term, how great the, the growth would be depending on the nature of the future relationship with the European Union. And what that uh, analysis showed was that the, the deal that is on the table um, f is far better in terms of outcome than the no deal uh, outcome, which I suspect there would be broad agreement around the table here is undesirable, and that it was better, significantly better too than a standard free trade agreement. It's a matter of public record that the person in charge of the economy in the United Kingdom, Philip Hammond, has said that the economy relative to just now would be smaller as, as a result of this deal. So what that therefore means is that what in effect you're putting forward is he cuts Brexit, which would mean cuts in the Scottish budget, which would affect communities, which would mean less money to spend in schools and hospitals. So can I ask you, Minister, when MSPs come to consider and debate this deal in the Scottish Parliament next week, why should we give our support to a deal which will make our communities worse off? Well, because none of nothing of what Philip Hammond said yesterday, nothing that's in the Treasury documents that were published yesterday, um, suggested that people would be poorer than they are today. What they were looking at is the relative outturn, depending upon different scenarios, and leaving completely aside uh, uh, the questions of whether UK policy, or for the matter, EU policies might change in a way that reflected the comparative competitiveness of us on the one hand and the EU on the other. It was a, a, an attempt through analysis to isolate the economic impacts of different scenarios in terms of our future relationship with the EU. And that produced, I mean, I've known, I, I'm somebody who, you know, campaigned for Remain two years ago. I mean, I, you know, I was out of the doorstep arguing that economically that was the better thing. But that decision was taken within the UK in 2016 and people when they voted took account yes of the economic arguments but they took account of other arguments about sovereignty about control of laws and so on in coming to their decision and if as I do you accept that that was even though narrow it was a decisive outcome and a vast turnout then it seems to me usually we should be seeking a uh, a, a, an outcome now that both honours that democratic verdict, but also uh, does the maximum possible to promote growth and protect jobs and investment in, in the whole of our country. I'm not arguing about the referendum result. What I'm saying is that as a consequence of that, you are putting a deal on the table which will make people in the communities that we represent <laughs> worse off. So what, why, in all, in all honesty, can you say to us that we should support that? I'm saying look at the Treasury analysis, and if you accept, uh, uh, as I take from the question that uh, Mr Kelly does, uh, the outcome of the referendum, then the question is what is the best available membership outside, for partnership outside membership of the European Union? And what the Treasury analysis shows is that compared with those alternatives, this deal is very attractive indeed. Thank you, James. Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, Convener. Just continuing uh, on the same theme, Mr Liddington, I mean, we're taking a hell of a hammering, though, surely, to at rock bottom, to then begin to improve, as you say. The Chancellor himself said that every outcome makes everyone worse off. Do you, do you accept that, or do you deny that that's the case? What the, the phrase you're referring to when it was, is when he was talking about um, outcomes outside the EU compared with continued membership of the EU. But also, for the, uh, the Chancellor also said very plainly that he accepts the democratic legitimacy of the decision that was taken in 2016. So given that verdict, we have to plan for the best form of partnership with countries that are going to remain our neighbours, friends, allies, key trading partners for as far ahead in the future I can possibly predict. Um, I, 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 the best way for 
the economy of all parts of the United Kingdom and for all sectors of UK business. And, and that, I think, is the merit of what the Prime Minister has managed to negotiate. It has meant concessions both from the EU and from us, from our starting positions, as in any negotiation. It is a compromise, but I think it's a decent compromise that both the 52% and the 48% across the UK should be able to get behind. But do you recognise the, the figure, though, independent experts have put a figure on this? It could be £100 billion a year by the end of the 15-year period out of, you know, after Brexit. Do you recognise that, that that figure is there? Or there, there I've, seen, I've seen a number of different figures. It depends very much on the assumptions that are made. I know that in the, some of the research that... Um, the Scottish Government has published, just as in the, the work that the Treasury has done, the work the Bank of England has done, uh, there are notes explaining those assumptions, uh, and, and one has to, uh, you know, to look at those assumptions before coming to a judgment on, on those. I think the, what the Treasury analysis has done is to set out you know, a series of studies trying to isolate the impact of leaving the EU without taking account of other possible variables. Uh, that contribute to economic performance and growth. Uh, and in reality, you know, it will be in large part in our own hands. It will be the policies of the UK government, the policies of the Scottish government, the policies of the Welsh government that will determine the prosperity of the people we represent in the future. How long do you think it will take us to make up that kind of deficit, £100 billion a year, surely to goodness? Well, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't, I don't uh, as, uh, necessarily accept those those figures without testing the assumptions. But I, what I'm saying is if you accept the democratic verdict of 2016, then the evidence suggests, on the basis of the Treasury analysis, that the, uh, the deal that we have on the table is one that uh, delivers well compared with the alternatives that are available and possible, um, and, and are not some sort of fantasy of having all the... Um, benefits of EU membership without any of the obligations that go with EU membership. Okay, could I ask you, is it still the UK government's position to support the Tallinn Declaration that it signed in October 2017? Which declaration? The Tallinn Declaration in 2017. Your government signed it. You'll have it. Mr Coffey will need to give me some a bit more on that. It's, it's basically a commitment to remain within the digital single market. Digital single market. Uh, we remain of the view, we're, we're committed in the, um, the, uh, re, the uh, political declaration to a close partnership on this. Um, we're committed to new and specific arrangements on digital, um, covering a wide range of areas, including e-commerce, telecoms, and emerging technologies. And we've agreed to specific arrangements compared with the outline political declaration on telecommunication services so that we get fair and equal access to networks and services in both jurisdictions. Um, broadcasting is not, in, not uh, covered in the political declaration, but it's not specifically excluded or carved out either. And that, that, would, uh, that carve out would usually be the case in EU external trade agreements. So, you know, we would be formally outside the EU single market arrangement, so we would not be obliged to follow every um, new regulation or directive from the EU, but we are seeking urgently, for example, a, uh, an equivalence decision on data transfer, because that's clearly vital to both businesses and public services on both sides of the channel. I've no reason to think that a good um, sort of digital partnership with other EU countries is, is unattainable. I think it's in everybody's interest to have that. Further while I'm afraid I'm going to, if I'm going to make this, and I might just about to do it for snappy, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Vina. Good afternoon. Uh, let's see what we can squeeze into my six minutes. Um, uh, Mr Ladington, over a million Scots voted to leave the EU and I think many will be naturally suspicious of any deal that leaves them in some sort of transitional purgatory, i.e. Uh, they are bound by rules of the EU, rule takers, not makers and so on. Uh, what do you have to say to provide some comfort to them that the withdrawal agreement on the table will not let that happen? Um, uh, point one, um, they are getting... Uh, the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. Uh, 
the, re the restoration, repatriation, we'll have one terms it, of national control over lawmaking in this country. Um, there will be an end to the automatic free movement of people under, uh, under the European treaties. There will be an end to the system of annual budget payments uh, in line with a formula uh, agreed as, as part of the, the e of EU membership. Um, there will be, under the proposed deal, a two-year transitional arrangement, and I think the reassurance to people who supported Leave is that that is important for businesses large and small so that they have time to plan and adjust and they're not faced with the turbulence of perhaps changing uh, regulatory arrangements um, at least twice during the course of a very short period of time. We really want to minimise the, the times when business has to change uh, its regulatory compliance arrangements. Then I think if we're looking at the backstop, I think the assurance is that the political commitments that the others have given, uh, that they not to bring this into effect, or if it's there to end it as rapidly as possible, is backed up by what's in their interest. From their point of view, the 27 see the backstop as giving the United Kingdom unbalanced, unfair access, tariff-free to their markets uh, and quota-free without paying into the budget each year, without free movement, without uh, shouldering all the obligations of membership. That's why Barnier has been criticised in quite a number of European capitals in the last two weeks. Secondly, um, the Irish in particular see east-west trade as much more valuable economically than north-south trade. North-south is hugely important politically, but east-west is much more valuable. Therefore, they need Holyhead, Fishguard, Pembroke to be sorted out, not just uh, uh, the Irish border. And that can only come with the future partnership and ending any backstop arrangement. Third, the Commission has always been clear that legally they cannot erect a future partnership on the basis of a withdrawal agreement under Article 50. Because, as I said earlier, they can only have a future, a, a partnership agreement with a third country once it has left. Therefore, they know that with any year that passes, when we're in the backstop, the legal risk to them of a successful challenge, for example, from a business in the south of Ireland, that's in, in the Republic, that says, our uh, neighbour 10 miles north in the border has an unfair advantage over us, um, that legal risk increases. So there are very good reasons to reassure people who voted Leave that they will be getting what they, they want, that they shouldn't fear being locked into the backstop uh, semi-permanently, um, and, and we should take the, have good reasons for taking the EU27 at their word on that. If I could pick you up on, on the point around the, the fact that so many people are asking for a transition period and it appears that the withdrawal period offers that. Isn't it the reality though? And I think there needs to be a bit of a reality check around all of this. That what will happen after the 29th of March next year is one of two things. We will either enter into a transition period as is proposed in the withdrawal agreement or we leave with no deal and overnight become a third country. Now the evidence that we've taken uh, on, on numerous committees and numerous meetings is that no deal would be disastrous. Uh, for all parts of the UK, and we need that transition period. The CBI, the FSB, the NFU, the IOD, all these organisations are telling us that. Well, I'm inclined to listen to them. Why do you think so many politicians won't? I mean, it's a question that, that, that individual politicians will have to answer. I think amongst some politicians, there is still a lot of wishful thinking that the 27 are somehow going to go back and... Uh, uh, change the, the, the deal that they have worked very hard and made concessions to negotiate and which hasn't been easy in terms of compromise amongst themselves either. Let's not forget getting 27 countries to agree on a common proposition is far from straightforward. But I think Mr Green is absolutely right about the, the prospect of no deal. What that would mean is the end of March that, um, for example, um, meat and livestock exports would become subject not only to WTO uh, tariffs and quotas, which are pretty steep uh, in terms of the, the, the tariffs on, on beef or lamb exports, but also they would be subject to phytosanitary checks, 
which under EU law have to take place at a designated border inspection post. If I say that at the moment there is no designated border inspection post at either Calais or Coquel, which are the, 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 the two chief destinations for Roro freight, uh, that starts to tell you the scale of the problem. For the automotive industry, it would mean a 10% tariff plus the uh, requirement for rules of origin declarations, not just when an assembled car moved out of the UK, but whenever a widget that was part of a component moved backwards and forwards on the just-in-time cross-continental um, production systems and supply chains that we have at the moment. So the, this you know, no deal is not something that anybody should contemplate lightly. We have to plan against the risk, but it's not something that we should seek to do. Annabelle Yeo. Good afternoon, uh, Minister. Uh, let's talk about the real world. And is it not the case that there's no majority in the House of Commons for the PM's Brexit deal? There's no majority in the House of Commons for a no deal. Uh, and short of, of uh, Scotland remaining a member of the EU, which is what Scotland voted for, 62%, surely it is in Scotland's best interest to remain in the single market, a market of 500 million people, eight times the size of the UK market, to remain in the customs union and benefit from the some 50 trade agreements that the EU has as we speak right across the globe. That is what Scotland enjoys at present. Why do you want to make my constituents of Cowdenbeath and my country worse off? I want to give Ms Ewing's constituents in Cowdenbeath the prospect of the certainty that will arise for local businesses from a two-year implementation period so they have time to adjust and not face a cliff edge. I want um, uh, her businesses and her uh, consumers in Cowdenbeath to have the free trade agreement in goods and foodstuffs that is provided for in the political declaration and the close alignment on and partnership on customs and on uh, regulation that is also proposed in the political declaration. I want them to have the security uh, partnership through policing and criminal justice cooperation that is provided for in the political declaration. And I also want her constituents to continue to have access to the UK-wide single market that is of such value to them. Can, can I just say on the issue of the, the, the two-year period, the idea that it would be certainty after two years, that is risible. I mean, you know, it is risible. We've heard comments about the, the time it will take to, to negotiate a deal. Uh, but, I mean, aside from the, the disappointing reply, I suppose it is a predictable reply to what we've heard for, 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 from the outside, I suppose. But, I mean, is it not just the case, Minister, that your Brexit deal is going down and that the UK government has no plan B in place as we speak? I think that uh, what is clear is that uh, there is no uh, proposition on offer from those who've expressed opposition to the Prime Minister's deal uh, that is likely to uh, be negotiable uh, or to be realistic or to be better in terms of outcome than the one that we have on the table. Um, and I think that I, I remain much more optimistic about the timescale because unlike Canada or Japan or Ukraine or Moldova um, or Singapore, we start from a position of complete alignment with conformity with um, EU rules and standards. And that therefore makes it much easier to define where any difference might uh, be, be agreed. We're not starting trying from scratch, trying to decide the, the, the nature and scope of any alignment. Well, I mean, all evidence uh, suggests uh, that a two-year period to negotiate a trade deal with the EU is completely unrealistic. But if that's your fantasy position, then that's fine. Can I just say, the better outcome for Scotland, and indeed the entire United Kingdom, is surely to stay in the single market and in the customs union. Any other option makes us worse off. Why did the Tory government want to inflate that on the people? I, th I think that um, Ms. Ewing does need to would need to accept that to do that. I mean, first of all, there's a question as to whether that would command a, a, a parliamentary majority. Um, but also, I think it would it is unrealistic to expect the European Union to accept that without um, acceptance on the United Kingdom's part of all the four freedoms. I mean, the, the, you know, that has been, you know, I think, a completely consistent line from the Commission and the 27 governments that stand behind them. And that does take you back to the freedom of movement question. It would also 
leave the United Kingdom as obliged to follow um, future EU rules in services. Now, in terms of goods, the goods acquis has been stable for about the last 30 years. It's not likely to change in any significant way. The acquis on services is much more dynamic, and I think with us not at the table, it is probable that it will um, develop in a way that is perhaps more protectionist of EU interests on things like financial services, um, and that there will be considerable advantages to us in remaining out with the scope of those services single market arrangements, because services growth is where there will be the greatest global opportunity in the future. Goods cases are in court of justice every other month, so the idea okay. that the acquis is some sort of fixed, stable thing for goods is completely untrue. Okay. Listen, Minister, thank you. For, we appreciate you coming in front of us. I think all of us would like this session to have been longer. I think we've all got other questions we'd like to have asked, but at least you've come and given us a session this afternoon. We're, we're, we're up against the clock because we've got uh, a voting very shortly. So thank you for coming today. Very grateful. I now close the meeting.